The Echo Chamber, brought to you by The Homes Report and produced by the international broadcast specialist, Marketeers. Sponsored by The Bullet Group, putting you in tomorrow's conversations today. Hello everyone and welcome to the Echo Chamber. I'm Maya Pavinska-Sims, the Homes Report's EMEA editor. And I'm in a rather breezy London today with PR and comms practitioner Colin Woods, who has escaped the worst of Hurricane Brendan to fly over from Ireland, especially to chat to me about his first book, which is called Tailored Thinkers. Colin, welcome to the Echo Chamber. Thanks for being here. Great to be here. Um, I don't mind you saying as an opening gambit that you're pretty young to have written a book on PR and comms as a 27 year old now just turned 28 last just week just turned 28 happy birthday Thank you very another much. capricorn um tell us what the book is about and what drove you to put pen to paper quite so early in your career yeah it's strange because i guess when you're living it um it doesn't feel particularly early for me but rather uncharacteristically i'm actually a decade in and around the industry this year okay um, it started at around 17, 18, trying to figure out what I wanted to do when I left school. And this uh, word or industry pure came into my sphere by a collection of people who didn't really know what it was, but knew someone who did. Okay. Um, so I was introduced to um, Michael O'Keefe at the time, who's now CEO of uh, Teneo in Dublin. Mm. Um, That's a very good first contact to have. That, yeah, <laughs> we were. Age. I was at the uh, the start of my uh, adult football career, and he was uh, approaching his twilight years. He won't mind me saying. Okay. Um, But it was a great introduction. It was an independent agency at the time um, called Pembroke Communications. But the door was opened uh, to come in and get some work experience. And I loved the variety, um, which I think comes across in everything else I've tried to do Mm. since. But it was an opportunity that I was consistently drawn back to. When I was studying communication studies um, as a broader degree, I spent every Christmas and summer uh, running in and out of the agency from wrapping mugs to media drops mm. um, or buying a, buying a black T-shirt for a photo shoot. <laughs> um, all those jobs that really helped me start um, in the proverbial mailroom of the industry and see what it was like. So, yeah, 28, it's strange to find myself 10 years in the industry or certainly in and around it. Um, but it was that feeling of being maybe one of the lower percentage of people in the industry who studied it, um, got a master's degree in it, um, a very traditional route, um, if non-traditional, for the type of people you find in the industry. Um, And by seeking a range of experiences and a range of clients in the last 10 years, I felt like it just needed a bit of distillation and a bit of simplification. not to be um, dogmatic or to be prescriptive, but to liberally just start this conversation about an industry I'm really passionate about. So uh, tell me about the title, Tailored Thinkers. Yeah, it it came to me um, at two o'clock in the morning on the tarmac uh, of Dubai International Airport um, after a couple of days of work uh, at an event. And I suppose I spent three years uh, traveling around the Middle East, uh, working as a PR and strategic communications consultant. And every week I was on airplanes filled with mostly men in suits. Mm -hmm. Um, And it just kind of suddenly became bizarre to me um, or novel to just sit back and become aware of all these people, mostly men, um, sitting around obsessing over PowerPoints, um, not putting on their seatbelt in time for takeoff because they're trying to solve a problem. Mm. Um, And it was more a reflection of my situation at the time of these, you know, this multi-billion dollar consultancy industry. Um, For then coming to it with the book, I deliberately wanted something that was uh, seemed familiar. So a play on Tinker Tailor, Soldier Spy. Mm -hmm. Um, And to really play on the words of tailoring our thinking and tailoring our communication to get people and audiences to think about our client messages. So I really wanted the the bang for book title for what I was trying to get across. And what's your aim with the book? 
the aim is very much to to start a conversation. As I said, I wanted to fill a gap that I identified between the um, upper echelons of the industry, like the global forums and academia, who are having these really big conversations Mm. on at least an annual basis, if not more regularly than that, and the kind of working majority of the industry that kind of people more of my age probably take up. Um, And I know that there's a lot of really interrogative conversation happening at these forums and with all of the white papers and everything that's released. But there was a lack of distillation that I saw um, of the big things that weren't just filtering through to everyone else. Mm -hmm. Um, It also came from the near daily, if not weekly, existential crisis of a barista or taxi man asking, what do you do? Okay, Um, well, we've all experienced that working in this industry. Yeah, and I think the longer I spent in the industry, and it's something that I think a lot of people might relate to, it's almost become harder to define what we do. Um, So it was as much a personal challenge to try and distill everything I'd seen in both study and practice. Um and make the industry accessible and appealing to younger generations mm-hmm. in a way that I probably wouldn't have had exposure to. Well, I think that's a, a, a very worthy thing. One of, the, one of the things I loved about the book is the fact that you're incredibly well, I mean, far more well read than I am. And you bring in thinking and possible solutions and ways of looking at PR and comms problems from loads of really esoteric different directions. Uh, worlds as varied as military strategies, first one you tackle, there's Greek philosophy in there, there's behavioural science, there's all kinds of stuff that informs your thinking about comms and PR. Um, what, what do you think some of the biggest lessons for the industry from completely different um, outside uh, influences are, in your view? What are what some of your favourite examples in the book? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it comes through in the book. Um, I start every chapter with a kind of quote from... Some good quotes uh, in there, including people. Justin Bieber. Yeah, I was <laughs> going to say, we have, we have everything mili- from Marcus not, Aurelius to Justin Bieber. That's not the military strategy. No, no not <laughs> quite, but not, not far off it either. Um, I think I've always been interested to the point of near obsession with polymaths and people who are deliberately curious about a wide variety of things, Mm. people who kind of shy away from specialism because they know that, you know, the more you know about something, the less you might know about everything else. Um, And for me, having been around the industry for so long, I've always seen, you know, the traditional polymaths as very similar to the modern PR professional. Um, You know, based on the job description trends over the last you know, five to ten years, mm. we've gone as far as hyper segmentation of our work and hyper yeah. silos. And I think it's coming back to a more natural, all rounded professional. Mm. So I wanted to interrogate the fundamentals of the work, which in I've, I've had the opportunity to go and speak uh, to secondary schools in the last couple of months, as well as guest lecture in some colleges in Ireland. And it's been great to distill it all the way down for a 15 and 14 year old. Yeah. And to just, just and the way I found to do that is describe it as like just having shaping and influencing conversations yeah. and to get them to understand what we do on a daily basis. I'll give the example that you don't WhatsApp your mother the same thing you WhatsApp your best friend. No, you don't. I, st- <laughs> <laughs> I definitely don't. To say the least. Um, but it's just this understanding that we are experts in managing the expectations Mm. of different audiences when it comes to communication and it's funny to look back on you know back in the Nokia 3210 days Mm. I was uh, the guy who was helping the other lads to decipher and send messages to the girls that they fancied or you know just I had this inherent understanding that different situations required a different approach yeah um, in school, in in English, uh, having to learn a formal letter, it never struck me as odd that I might never write a formal letter in my life. Mm. It was just another way to challenge my delivery. Yeah. Um, and in many ways, that goes back to the writing of a book, having prepared content for all types of clients for so many years. A end-to-end book was pretty much the only piece of content I hadn't attempted yeah. so far. So it was this real personal challenge to 
try and write something that was fit for format, mm-hmm. but also maybe fit for audience. So to go back to your original question, like any good PR man should segue, um, I mean, I really enjoy finding similarities in completely outside uh, sources. Mm-hmm. Um, there's reference to um, the ostracization of capuchin monkeys when they lie to the troop. Um, yeah. As an example of the need to be honest in dealing with people. Um, that came to me, I'm sure, one night watching a David Attenborough documentary. Yeah, I didn't know monkeys could lie, but there you go. There you go. Well, not very successfully, it seems, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> maybe the that. same could be said of ourselves. Um, but yeah, it, I've just developed a greater appreciation for lateral thinking. Mm. Um, I know myself, I used to be a very straightforward black and white learner. Um, I learned for a subject to do well in an exam. And it's only in the last five or six years that I've seen the ability to connect dots and the value that can bring. Um, I never would have seen myself as a creative person purely because I don't draw. Mm. I spent three years trying to learn the violin and never got beyond Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. Um, But... The message that I've tried to get across to particularly younger generations is that there are different versions of creativity and creative thinking doesn't mean inventing a new app. It's just a different way of solving problems. So by having a career that kind of covered full service PR, sports sponsorship, corporate comms, public affairs, corporate strategy, it's amazing the crossover between a community sports sponsorship and a nation branding exercise and it's all those bits that join together to probably have allowed me to write a book at this stage of my career um well it's it's a brilliant read and i would also say that that uh you know I've, i've been writing about pr for 20 years and that inherent curiosity in the world at large regardless of what area you're looking at is something that defines all the best communicators I know you know the, the the ability to read around join the dots and come up with a something that is inherently then creative even if it looks like corporate comms or a lobbying strategy yes yeah. so you're, you're obviously a, a step ahead of um of most practitioners in in your understanding of that you've got this chapter called going back to that um the the looking at comms in a very broad way you've got a great chapter called meet jack of all trades which is really interesting in an industry that's still battling with that tension between siloed specialisms and true integration taught me taught me through that you use the example of a multi-tool yeah it's something that again i've i found quite helpful in talking to secondary school children Mm. um but also uh, peers senior and junior about certainly how i've structured my skill set or attempted to build it outside of my comfort zone the adaptability and the versatility of this industry is such that the things that we were doing three years ago are either redundant obsolete or Mm. executed entirely differently it's quite frightening isn't it it is Mm. and i think i've always been the type of person that is so afraid of whether failing or just not being equipped to handle a situation my reaction to that is to over equip right okay um so you know to use the example of the um swiss army knife there's no point being a bottle opener unless every problem you encounter is a bottle I think increasingly we need that multi-tool approach, even if you are a client manager or a client director Mm. with specialists to do the execution. If you are the relationship holder with the client, uh, most of us have found is that you have to be able to talk to their needs across multiple platforms, Mm. multiple channels, multiple delivery methods, even if you're not the person to execute on the day. But if you can turn your hand to a lot of those things, it can make your life a lot easier. Um, I had to take a production module as part of my degree and I studied photography for that. And it just meant that as a very young person going out to corporate comms photo shoots with cardboard cutouts of hashtags and the like. Yes, we don't we don't like those. We don't like those. (laughs) No, but it meant that in the delivery of that and a lot of that, as most people know, is is building the client's ease with being Mm. stood in the middle of a street somewhere with a giant sign. Um, from having that understanding of photography, I could build a rapport with the photographer quite easily. He could understand my needs. Yeah. I could understand his needs. And similarly with copywriting, if if you know how long something takes to write, roughly, you'll know if you're being 
messed about by freelancers or if you're being too hard on them, which yeah. is often the case. And I think a lot of the strain within any any industry, but more so in ours, which is so diverse, is a lack of empathy mm-hmm. and understanding for all the different functions and their needs. So I've tried to be as empathetic in my approach and I can only do that if I have an understanding of what another person's trying to do. Um, I read something interesting about empathy this week. I can't remember what context it was. It's often seen as a soft skill, but actually it feels to me increasingly like it's a critical business yeah, ab- skill. Yeah, absolutely. And um, Because if you don't understand your, your colleagues, your client, their audiences... And empathy is just about understanding, isn't it? And you can't communicate if you don't understand. Exactly. And it's often conflated with sympathy. Yeah. Um, and I I wrote in the book about, you know, when people think of empathy, they think of an agony aunt. Mm. Someone saying, oh, poor you, yeah. you know, dump him <laughs> 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 and the likes. But empathy is, is purely an, un, an ability to understand other people yeah. and read other people. And that can be used for good or for bad. You have someone like Roger Stone, if anyone has mm. seen Get Me Roger Stone on Netflix, who yeah. is credited with Trump's rise or certainly um, creating the conditions in which he could rise. And that was purely from an understanding of the hatred and insecurity that was bubbling away amongst that audience. Yeah. Um, he didn't use that to settle them down or to talk them straight he you know he poured gasoline on it yeah. and for his end so I think that empathy is possibly one of the most important tools for client services full mm. stop anything else can flow from that um, and it goes back to the heart of what we're trying to do as you know certainly PR consultants if we take a more prognosis based approach rather than a prescription approach it just automatically shows the client that we've taken the time to figure out their needs Mm. rather than just coming with a quick fix solution yeah that's what we've done before yeah exactly so um i'm going to use the dreaded word the m word millennial yeah uh doesn't always come with the most positive associations from us oldies in the industry which i apologize what's it actually like being in your 20s in pr now it's different. Um, it's not all smashed avocado and is it not? latte art. <laughs> it is a lot. If you, if you follow my Instagram, you would think so. There are still a lot so. of avocados involved. Um, but it's different. And I was trying to, again, think of an external uh, reference for this. Um, there is a US rapper called J. Cole, um, Grammy Award winning. And he has this song on his latest album called Middle Child. Okay. And he describes himself as being the kind of big brother for everyone who's entering the industry, but still seen as the little brother for those who kind of lay the foundation. Yeah. And I think that being a millennial in PR at the moment is very much like that. We make up probably the body of the professionals um, or the professional body. And the things that we're doing now didn't exist for the people that came before us. So yeah. it's completely new territory. And we might be more aware, given the pace of change, that it's not going to be the same for the generations coming after us. Yeah. Um, we're spared a lot of the really tough stuff. Well, you know, I haven't founded and run an agency. I haven't had to fire anyone. I haven't had to decide who gets a Christmas bonus. Mm. Um, but there is a strain on... A huge part of the industry, which um, you wrote about in in October for the Homes Report, about 89% of the industry struggling with mental health. Yeah, absolutely. And this, you know, as much as we support our clients in engaging with this 24-7 content obsessive consumption environment, we're also part of it. Mm. And we're also consumers, either on a personal, professional level. So now it is very much 24-7 always on. You can expect to be called at 2 o'clock in the morning. If a story breaks, you haven't got until the next day. You can't, you know, you might not necessarily be ringing up an old newspaper editor who you pints with on every Tuesday night. It could be a tweet from someone who fell over in a store in Australia. Um, But there is this kind of restlessness that's required of people in the industry and I think understandably that's causing a strain yeah no I can see that it's um it, it's interesting because you know I do the same I, I reminisce about having a, a a weekly press day like there's any such thing <laughs> yeah. now in, in any industry 
but um, and I certainly, I'm a, you know, I love social media and I use digital uh, in all sorts of ways. But uh, I'd know, you know, I'm not a digital and social media native, whereas you are. What do you think the benefit is of having people on your team that, that have only ever known that kind of that pace and that multiplicity of platforms? Um, I mean, it's it's obviously a strain on individuals. But it is all you've ever known. Do you think agencies and in-house teams make the most of that understanding, innate understanding and, and the talent in that area? Yeah, some some do very well. And I think a lot of people, uh, a lot of my peers who I would speak to would say that they are given a lot of autonomy and trust mm. in that field. Often the challenge can be breaking out of the stereotypical digital marketing, uh, social media, community management mold to get into the more big picture thinking, yeah. strategic work. Um, it often will do a large cohort of that workforce a bit of a disservice if they're only a piece of the puzzle rather than seeing end to end, which is often reserved for the old heads who are looking at big picture. So you're the, you're, you're the young person, you can be the social media guy. Exactly. You know, that, I mean, it's a cliche, but it's It is true, a cliche, right? but it does hold relatively tr- true. The other side of it, though, as you pointed out, you know, it's not a, a lament for millennials in the industry. Um, they very much, or we, I should say, very much have this adaptability mm. to pace that I think is worthwhile and I think is suited to the industry. Mm. It's also becoming an increasingly accessible industry, even if that is through social media. Again, in in speaking to school classes, I kind of said to them, if you want to be a heart surgeon, you can't just hang around a hospital ward and ask what they're poking around in. But if you want to work in PR, you can just pay attention to the way that you engage with content that you like and you don't like, which sort of corporate content, you know, elicits a response what do you pick up in the papers and say they should never have gotten away with that? Mm. And you automatically have this repertoire for how the industry works. Yeah. Um, so in, in that way, it's, it makes it hugely accessible. I think what we need to balance is, and it's, it's part of what I tried to do with the simplification of the industry and the book is we're at that point now where it is a breaking point when you look at the, the levels of mental health struggle. Mm. Um, and it it is just going to be a matter of, you know, the old heads and the young upstarts coming together to work uh, smarter instead of harder. Yeah, I know. I would to- I would totally agree with you. And you talk about in the book about um, your own anxiety, if you don't mind me mentioning yeah. that. And of course, you, we've, uh, mental health and well-being is quite rightly now firmly on the industry's agenda. And I think mm. everyone's been quite surprised by it. Now, it's not taboo anymore how high those levels are because, you know, there's and probably higher given that some people are still not going to be comfortable saying, yes, hands mm. up, I'm struggling or have struggled. How what, in your view, still needs to be done for the industry to support um, the mental health and well-being of its practitioners across age groups? Yeah. And it's probably worth saying that, you know, some some companies are excellent at doing this yeah. and it, it certainly is of the zeitgeist now that people are talking about it and people are um, addressing it or certainly learning how to because again it you know stigmatism has to be unlearned Mm. like anything else and I think most people who work in comms will find that their own internal comms is worse than anything they would ever recommend yeah. to a client. Or their own external comms. Exactly. Yeah. The struggles I have getting a decent release out of people. You, you'd, be, <laughs> you'd be very surprised. Um, I mean, it's about understanding it. And certainly, personally, for me, I can now look at it as an asset, you know, with an anxiety disorder. The parts that are more social anxiety makes me very attuned to... Mm exchanges between people um, which is great if you're a communications yeah. professional you're quite good at reading the room you're quite good at reading oh, where tension yeah. needs to be broken maybe too much so at times but you have this inherent empathy not necessarily for me out of a need to you know make sure every exchange is perfect but just almost out of a need to avoid an anxious awkwardness yeah. <laughs> um, but it can be you know, where the challenge is, I think, comes with the lack of work-life balance. Mm -hmm. And where the solution is, I'm not so sure. What we all strive to be in this industry is that 
absolute go-to trusted advisor for the client, way more than a technical expert. Yeah. You want to be the person that they lean on and they rely on. And most people will know that crises never happen at 11 o'clock in the morning. They do not, no. <laughs> and they never happen on a Tuesday. It's always at 11 a.m. on a Sunday or 8 p.m. on a Friday. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's part of, you know, what we say is the life we chose Um, And something that I think most people in the industry truly value getting to that point. Um, Where we can do better from all the people that I would speak to, um, I just think is cutting the waste. And it's part of what I tried to get to with the book is we have a default to show our multi-tool. We want to take out that Swiss army knife and pluck out every single bit of it and say, look at all the toothpick, including the toothpick (laughs) and the toothbrush. And every probably has an internal microphone in it these days for all I know. But it's more about, you know, again, to go back to the basic example, if the client needs a bottle of beer open, all you need is a bottle opener. And by simply doing that stuff very well, we free ourselves up to do the thinking that will allow the value add. Mm. We'll do the bottle opening well, mm. <laughs> to stick with our strange example. Um, and to also make sure that the people have time to recharge mm. and be creative. You know, I'm 28, but it's been fantastic. I've been fortunate to take a sabbatical since moving back from the Middle East. And it's been incredible to see the effect that has had on my creativity, mm. on my ability to think through problems, on my ability to solve things that I probably wouldn't have had the headspace for before. Yeah. So I think at a day-to-day level, it's going to come down to our people management. And yeah. whether it's line managers or mentors or directors, if someone just needs to work from home on a Tuesday, you know, because they had a late-night catastrophe the night before, absolutely fine and most people are you know very good at that now but it just needs to happen at a scale where we start to declutter all the noise that is not reaching audiences just taking up space on a spreadsheet or on a whip document yeah. and kind of focus on the things that really move the dial for clients yeah, absolutely having that headspace and uh, or space in general and time for thinking and clarity is like so rare now isn't it It almost feels like a luxury having time to think rather than you know to respond rather than to react I just that's so noticeable I mean I guess across industries but particularly in a you know always on global 24-7 where putting a statement out is going to have to happen within 15 minutes not within two hours or whatever Um, But no, I totally agree with you. I I don't know how we solve that because it feels like technology has moved faster than we've evolved as human beings. And that need to recharge is still there, but we haven't got the space for it anymore. So you've got to to make space for that within your running of your team almost, haven't you? Yeah. I mean, it's critical now. It is. And I, I really like the nuance of that respond rather than react because, again we are part of this obsessively consuming audience Mm. as much as we are professionals in the industry. So it has become innate to react and we all have to catch ourselves. So it's whether we have the, you know, ability and the confidence, I think, and the professional integrity to say, you know, I need to figure that out for you. Let me come back. Um, And it's that tension we always have in trying to get a seat at the top table versus being that department that Mm. might just be cut uh, from, you know, the big conversations until we're told to do a press release or an event. So we're balancing having to have an answer all the time versus having the time to give an appropriate answer. And I think a lot of people in the industry struggle with a client or a a CEO understanding of their role. Um, And again, that's very true in a way being forced to distill it for um, younger audiences in schools. You know, I describe it like like a, like the way you would teach a child about a better conversation. Mm. You have two ears, two eyes and one mouth. Yeah. So if we're really going to be valuable to, you know, both clients, internal and external, we can't be producing content 24-7. Yeah. We have to have that moment where we're, we should be doing far more insight gathering, in, interrogating data, 
research base and then making sure that it's outcome focused. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I totally agree with you. I love that analogy. Um, what advice, briefly uh, and finally, would you give to young people just starting out in PR now, thinking out of comms as a possible career path for themselves? I mean, I would say that it's one of the best careers you could have if you are an inherently curious person. Mm. Um, the amount of people with the job title, uh, with a job title within PO on communications who are doing vastly different work, um, for better or for worse. Mm. <laughs> um, and I think it's that flexibility to move within the industry mm. is what everyone starting out should allow themselves. Um, when I was even leaving my degree course, I was convinced I wanted to work in sports sponsorship my whole life. And just two, three years in the in the trenches of it, and my curiosity peaked with corporate comms. Yeah. And it just was like, you know what, I'm more interested in this. And by not over-specialising, I was able to keep a 50-50 split mm. in the agency I was in, which was a huge asset to me. Um, but just keeping myself as more... Uh, a general advisor and a consultant while learning how to do all the individual tactics. Yeah. It gave myself the freedom to flitter between different jobs. Yeah. Um, I think in 10 years, for some reason, um, pharmaceuticals is the only industry I've never worked with a client okay. in. Um, you can tick that box at some point. No doubt. Maybe not. Maybe not. <laughs> that's, a, mean, that's a different ball game. No, the one that's one too many. Um, uh, Colm, I love you've brought your whole self to the industry. Artist, scientist, uh, curious mind, and um, and to the book. And I, we wish you every success in the future. I'm sure whatever you, whoever you go and work for next will be incredibly lucky to have you. Um, and I also doubt very much it'll be the last book you write. Um, so thank you so much for joining me in the Echo Chamber today. Thanks for having me. Cheers. You've been listening to the Echo Chamber. Brought to you by The Homes Report and produced by Marketeers. Sponsored by The Bullet Group, putting you in tomorrow's conversations today. Today.